All right, so it's been a very long time since I made uh, my last Zig video. It was about two months ago where I said uh, Zig just broke my brain. And I basically was going through the uh, Pedro Park's Zig book and had finished the introduction introduction section of this book. Link will be in the description down below. And I was basically telling people in that video that this is going to be a server series where I'll continue to build on Zig. Well, clearly, I haven't done a good job of creating these videos. I truly haven't done a good job of continuing with the series. However, excuses aside, let's go right into this video of jumping in control flow and different function parameters and different structures and object oriented programming, everything we like about Zig, I'm gonna dive into it right now. So just to start, I'm gonna tell you that I'm using Zig version uh, 15.1. And if I do a Zig build run, you can see that all I've done so far is made a uh, Zig init with the default boilerplate that comes with running Zig on this version. Okay, and just before we start, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just import all of this stuff into this file here. So I have my const standard out. I can just get this out of here. So I have the interface and then I could just grab this and paste it here. And if I go back and run Zig, you can see Zig build test. So it's running my main. That's because I don't want to have anything in my root.zig right now. So I'm just going to basically use one uh, tab here. All right, and I'm also just gonna split my windows like this, just so it's a bit easier to see both the screens at the same time, just so I don't have to go back and forth. Okay, so the very first part is very basic. They're gonna just show us uh, kind of like a control system for if else, kind of the basics for anything programming related, the bare essential if x, is greater than 10. This should look exactly like a pretty standard um, if else structure in most programming languages that you may have come across before. I'm going to say x is less than or equal to 10. Save this. And if I run this, there you go. And we actually can just break the line like so. Boom. Okay. Basic if else structure, nothing too crazy. Don't forget the flush. Uh, and then we go into switch statements, which actually is a bit interesting. So here we have this uh, enum called role, which could be one of these values here. And then we have our main function. And then basically we have this constant role, which is the value of SE in the enum. And then we have our switch statement here. So depending on what role is, you can see here could be a bunch of these values. So if role is of the PM, SE, DP, or PO, and we use this precursor of dot notation, then we can print area is platform, or then we can set area as platform. You can see here, the variable area is just an undefined uh, U8, uh, our list of const U8. Remember, this is just a basic kind of way to write an undefined string, because there's no native string types in Zig, if you haven't forgot. Here, if it's DE or DA, we have data analytics, and then if it's KS, we will set area to sales. And if we run this function here, you will see that we have platform because the role we have is SE, which catches this switch statement here. Uh, but it's interesting, uh, switch statements must exhaust all possibilities. So one very important aspect about switch statements in Zig is that they must exhaust all existing possibilities. In other words, all possible values that could be found inside the role object must be explicitly handled in this switch statement. And so what this means, if I add another value here, like OP, and I go ahead and save this, and I run this, you can see here that note, unhandled enumeration value OP, because my switch statement here does not exhaust the possibility that role can also be OP. And here, if I just add it into this one for a second, uh, unknown identifier OP, oh, because I don't have the dot notation. If I save this and run it, you can see here, now recompiled, and there you go, now it's platform. And another interesting thing about switch statements is here the else statements. You can see here we have this switch byte, uh, and then the else is writer write byte with this period. And basically, an else branch in switch statement works as the default branch. So whenever you have multiple cases in your switch statement where you want to apply the exact same action, you can use else branch to do that. And they actually make a note here. So many programs would also use an else statement to handle a not supported case, kind of like a, a fallback, a catchback case, right? Uh, so a case that cannot be properly handled by your code or just a case that should not be fixed. Therefore, you can use an else branch to panic or raise an error in your program to stop current execution. And you can see I have this example here. So const level, it's just four and be, and then do a const category, so just switch statement between level. So one, two is a beginner, three is professional, else not supported level. And then we can call this and we get this not supported 
panic because level is in fact four. It's not one, two, or three. So then we panic on it. Another cool thing about Switch is you can range for it. So you can see here level is now four and we can range using this triple ellipsis uh, notation, zero to 25, we can write beginner. 26 to 75 would be intermediary. And then 76 to 100 is professional. And if it's anything else or not in that value, which is impossible. So if it's uh, greater than 100, we'll just get not supported. So if you run this, we'll get beginner. Now, the last thing that's interesting about switch statements in Zig is actually labeled switch statement. So here, you know, in the previous section, they talked about the labeling blocks. But here, if we have this label XSW right here to a switch statement, you can use this label in conjunction with the continue keyword to go back to the beginning of the switch statement. So you can actually kind of like iterate over the switch statement in a sense. In the example below, the execution goes back to the beginning of the switch statement two times before ending at the three branch. So here we have our switch statement, this is our label, and we pass in the value one. So if it's one, we actually just print first branch and we can continue by calling the exact same label switch statement with the next value two. And then if it's two, we continue and actually, I, and I, I can actually demonstrate this by printing it in my console. Okay, so I don't know why my LSP is giving me a bunch of issues. I even tried restarting it, but regardless, I had to make a small, some small modifications. So case one, two, three, four, we have first branch and second branch. So I added these with these explicit standard out flushes. And now if I run them, you can see even here, first branch, second branch, and platform from the previous switch example uh, above or right here. Okay, so now we're going to go into another section, a basic control structure, for loops, and while loops. The way I like to think of loops in Zig is that the syntax is very obvious for me personally. It's nothing too complex. It's not like tricky syntax. It's very clear what's happening. So I'm going to walk you through a very basic example here uh, on my editor. So Khan's name is Melky. Again, this is like a slice of strings uh, or a slice of U8 because Zig doesn't have native strings. And then for name and then, you know, in brackets for name and then zero double dot character I. What's happening here is this for keyword is going to iterate over the name Melky, which is a slice, and then it's going to iterate through every single item in the slice, starting at the zeroth index all the way to the end. And then it's going to pipe the characters and the index out into these variables here. So I have it as character and I put these, you can name these whatever you want. Just know that the first one will always be the actual value of in the slice. And the second one is the index of the value in the slice. And here I'm going to standard out print any and D which is character and I. But if I run that, you can see I get the raw byte representation of Melky 77101 and the index number here. And if I were to change this from any to just character, save this, and if I rerun this, now you can see I have Melky. And you can even, if you don't need both values, you can use underscore to ignore it. And then here we can just go something like this and then remove the character here and just keep the digit. And if you run this, now you can see we have just the indexes of the values in our slice array. All right, and while loops are pretty cool. They do a lot of like quality of life improvements to a while loop in my opinion, but basically there's a keyword while and it's very simple to what you expect of a while loop. So while I is less than five, you know, print something and increment by one until this condition's met and then the while loop uh, will stop. And another cool thing, that Zig does is you can specify the increment expression to be used at the beginning of a while loop. So here, instead of having the increment at in the actual closure of the while loop uh, structure, you can actually have it here with this notation. So while I is less than five, we will increment I after every run and we can continue with our standard print. It's kind of just like a nice uh, quality of life feature in my opinion, but this kind of brings us into function parameters being immutable when defining them in Zig. And there's a very easy example here that they have. So they create this function add to, which takes a U32 and returns a U32. And here we have X equals X plus two. So we're changing the value. And then when we do const wise add two, passing in four, we can see here error cannot assign to constant. So we cannot change the value that we pass in into our add to function. But there's a way that you can kind of overcome this, and that's where we introduce pointers in Zig and how to use them. If you've never used pointers, I'll keep it basic. Uh, a pointer just basically points to a location of memory, and they're denoted with this kind of star uh, asterisk symbol here. If you watch any of my Go videos, I've talked about it before, and this is basically how you get around it. So 
we now have add to is a pointer to a u32 and then we dereference the value so constant d is a u32 it equals two and then we add the value to to our dereference pointer value so this will be the actual value so in this case it is four so in our function main we have var x to u32 is four we pass in the actual pointer so we pass it in this is the notation for passing in the actual value of four instead of a copy and then you can see we can actually mutate this value even in this code example above Above, the x argument is still immutable, which means that the pointer itself is immutable. Therefore, you cannot change the memory address that it points to. However, you can dereference the pointer to actually validate the point to and also change its value if you need to. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video here because I want to dive into structs and object oriented programming very specifically in a dedicated video titled like how structs work in zig because this was something that I was always kind of fascinated with go and how go handles like object oriented programming by introducing things like structs and interfaces and you can even see here zig is a language more closely related to c which is a procedural language than it is to c plus plus or java which are object oriented languages because of that, you do not need to have advanced OOP patterns available in Zig, such as classes, interface, or class inheritance. Nonetheless, OOP in Zig is still possible by using struct definitions. So this is something I, you know, have strong opinions on. I want to discover more on, and I'm going to dive deeper into this in the next video. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Sorry for the late. I'm going to continue making Zig videos. I've just been slow about it. There's no excuse, but hopefully you guys continue to support it and uh, embrace me in the Zig community. I'll still make Go videos. Don't worry about that. I'll try to still make Go videos. If you have any uh, like you know, topics you want me to discuss, leave them in the section below and I'll get them. Peace.